Good morning, you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint. I'm Darshan Mehta. Let's take a look at what happened as far as the global markets are concerned. And you can see that most of the uh, markets across the globe have ended with a negative bias. US was down. Europe also ended with a negative bias. And bearing for uh, Nikkei, which is trading up almost uh, 70 points, uh, most of the other Asian indices are trading with a negative bias. What we are seeing as far as the SGX Nifty is indicating that there probably will be pain on opening. The SGX Nifty is indicating a gap down by almost 40 points at this point of time. Uh, ADRs also ended weak. You had counters like Tata Motors, which was down 4%. Vedanta was down 3%. And selling continues in the private sector banks like HDFC Bank and ICICI Bank. Dr. Eddie's pretty much was the only exception. Now, yesterday was not a great day as far as the Nifty was concerned. The Nifty ended rather flat in trade. But there was selling pressure that was seen on the mid cap and the small cap end of the market. Much more selling was seen on the banking side of the, of the market. Uh, the Nifty Bank was down 8 tenths of a percent, led by selling in Kotak Bank and HDFC Bank. While while the Nifty PSU banking index was down over one and a half, or close to one and a half percent in trade. So there was overall weakness that was seen. Uh, some sectors that managed to buck the trend. IT has been doing well given how rupee has been moving, and FMCG because of most of the companies trading at record highs has been seeing a lot of traction on the positive side. Now basically FIs were net buyers in the market yesterday, and so were DIs. But on a month-to-date basis, FIs have sold in 600 crores, DIs have bought in 1300 crores in the cash market. Now if you're looking at what the contribution was, it was basically Reliance, which crossed a market cap of 8 lakh crores in trade yesterday. LNT gained because of the buyback and the rupee impact clearly being felt on Infosys and TCS. Private sector banks, HDFC Bank and Kotak Mahindra Bank seeing selling pressure and SBI joined in and that is why the Nifty PSU banking index was also down in trade. Now on the future side, what we are seeing is that there was no doubt fresh buying was that was seen on the Nifty. Open interest build up was 3 tenths of a percent. As far as the Nifty bank was concerned, there was long unwinding that was seen. Open interest was down almost 14 percent for the counter. Now basically, if you are looking at where positions are being built. Still, the put writers are much more aggressive. Uh, what we're seeing is the bears, uh, bulls are, are attractive at the 10,400 and 10,500 level in trade. But there is a resistance that will come in as far as the 11,600 mark is concerned. Now, what happened in trade yesterday? We're seeing that both uh, at the 11,500 and 11,600 level, put writers were much more aggressive. Uh, given the, the fact that, you know, despite the market being down 40 points, uh, still it's uh, the market is in the bullish trend. Uh, two stocks remain in the FNO band. There is Jane Irrigation and Raymond. As far as the PCR is concerned, the Nifty PCR was flat in trade, but there was a drop as far as the bank Nifty PCR was concerned. Now, a couple of stocks that I want to point out. First of all, it's uh, Marico trading at record highs. Open interest build up of 6% on the long side. If you're looking at uh, X side, that's an open interest build up of 10% on the long side. So there is enough buying that is happening there. And MGL, despite the block deal happening, the counter not recovering. Open interest build up of 200% because of the block deal. The counter ended pretty much at the day's low. So these are all the top uh, domestic cues that we are getting in. Let's go across to Russell Inchin for all the top international headlines. Inflation remained steady in Japan last month, rising by 8 tenths of 1%, fractionally below estimates, but the same as in June. Prices minus fresh food and energy climbed by 3 tenths, bang on forecasts. Now, the readings show the Bank of Japan's 2% inflation target remains a long way out of reach. BOJ Governor Haruhiko Kuroda has skipped the Fed's Jackson Hole Symposium for the first time since taking the job. The NAFTA talks are set to spill over into next week as the US and Mexico work out a deal in order to reincorporate Canada. After two days of talks focused on auto production, Mexico said the two sides still have not resolved all their issues. Mexico will not consider negotiations complete until Canada also agrees to a deal, and that nation has not attended the talks in the last five weeks. Forex watchers say the Aussie dollar may fall to a two-year low of 70 US cents as political turmoil threatens paralysis in Canberra. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is clinging on to power by a thread as rivals line up to challenge him and ministers quit his team. He's Australia's sixth prime minister since 2007 and says he'll step aside if opponents have enough support to unseat him. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo heads to North Korea next week. He wants to ensure that Kim Jong-un sticks to his promise to shut down his nuclear program. He's enlisted former Ford executive Steve Belgun to lead in negotiations to, with Pyongyang. Washington wants tough international sanctions to remain in force, but says there are signs China has resumed cross-border links. 
And Elon Musk is said to have hired Morgan Stanley for advice on his Go Private plan. Bloomberg is told the bank is working directly with him, not with Tesla, the board, or the special committee set up to evaluate the idea. Morgan Stanley is suspended its coverage of the stock early this week without any explanation. The bank is among Tesla's top 20 shareholders with a stake of six tenths of 1%. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rosalind Chin. This is Bloomberg. The Indian authorities have brought down the fiscal deficit. What has expanded is the current account deficit, a lot of it driven by the higher oil price. And that's why I said commodity prices sure. do have an effect. Now, um, the rupee has depreciated. Now, I think it hasn't depreciated at too worrying levels. Uh, it's sort of dollar strength uh, around the world. And to some extent, the rupee over time hadn't depreciated enough uh, because of the uh, higher than uh, world inflation in, the U uh, in India. All that said, I, I think this is a time where countries should be focusing on getting the macro in order, on getting macro stability. And going into an election year as India is, as Brazil is, it's very important that all these emerging markets try their level best to look as good as possible. We know an interesting story in uh, India lately is the release of this unofficial data, which showed that under the previous uh, administration of Mr. Singh, uh, growth was much higher than it is under Mr. Modi, and there's been a lot being, you know, is Mr. Modi now doing enough to help all those Indians who need to be lifted out of poverty, et cetera? Uh, what, how is that going to play out? Is this, a, is this a little tempest in the teapot that we in the media are stirring yeah. up, or is this important? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm on the side of, uh, well, what we have to do right now is look forward. And uh, India is recovering from a slowdown in the last couple of years. It's growing at about seven and a half. Now, you know, most countries would kill for seven and a half percent growth rate. So that's in India's favor. What it needs to do is also make sure that the current account deficit doesn't blow out. Uh, it needs to maintain fiscal uh, stability. And then I think it gives a picture of, you know, strong growth, but reasonable macro. That's a good thing to have at this point. What about the banks? The latest financial stability report from the RBI showed gross non-performing non loans still rising. Banks' earnings show them piling on more losses. Can they come out of the rut on their own, or will they need more help from the government? Maybe some capital infusion? What needs to be done? I, I think there is some capital infusion uh, on the way. Uh, I do think that we do need to improve the governance of these banks. This is a major reform, has to be done. My sense is uh, whichever new administration comes in, this will be task one for them. Stock of the day is Hexaware uh, Tech, where the promoter is looking to raise as much as 1,120-odd crore by offloading around 2.5 crore shares uh, via block deal at a floor price of uh, 447 per share, which indicates a 10% discount as compared to the previous closing price of the share. Uh, if you look at uh, the deal size, well, total shareholding pattern for uh, the promoter at this point of time, the bearing arm is currently at 71.2% of your overall capital. Deal size represents, however, 8% of equity capital and Citigroup Global Market has been the sole placement agent. If you look at the shareholding pattern, promoter share, uh, shareholding stands at 71, stood at 71% as of June 2018, while public shareholding stood at around 28.7%. Uh, we also have a brokerage note, IIFL, which has actually initiated uh, a coverage on this counter with an ad rating and a target price of around 5 20 per share. It says that the company, uh, the stock is a good long-term compounding story and says that margin expansion is expected to be a key for further re-rating of this counter. If you look at the analyst rating, uh, Bloomberg consensus analyst rating uh, on this counter, you have uh, the 12-month price target being uh, set at a 430, which indicates a potential of downside of 13% as compared to current market price. And if you look at the total buy hold sell while well, you have a more holes a more sell at 60 percent uh, the hold ratio at around 24 percent and the buy ratio currently at 16 percent 
let's get your check on the commodities and currency space starting off with commodities and oil prices if you look at the current screen uh, WTI is trading with a marginal gain uh, but however did manage to end on the losing end after five days of gains this was on the back of uh, the dollar which in fact advanced after six uh, straight uh, sessions of losing and uh, you know in terms of the US uh, inventory data we had positive news over there as well so EIA in fact reported an inventory slide of about 5.8 4 million barrels for last week and as per a JBC report uh, we understand that the global oil demand is likely to recover after the weakness in the second quarter that we have seen shifting focus to the base metal space the index itself snapped its uh, three-day gain now uh, you know copper fell on the back of the dollar index uh, which has uh, been declining and on the back of the US China tariffs which kicked in in fact uh, copper traders have now turned neutral on the back of uh, the entire scenario in the dollar index and the US China trade war concerns uh, now lead advanced for the third straight day in a row and was up about uh, two two and a half percent in trade that was the top gainer we had nickel and tin which fell more than one percent each while we had aluminium and zinc which ended with marginal gains now if you look at the Shanghai futures exchange most of the base metals are in fact trading with a positive bias except for steel which is down about three tenths of a percent and we have zinc which has gained nearly a percent uh, lastly shifting focus to the precious metal space we saw some bit of uh, weakness come about for gold prices on the back of uh, stronger dollar however remember that the dollar index had been on a declining streak uh, with that uh, let's shift focus uh, to the currency space uh, Saloni clearly while I was gone you were not able to manage the dollar index well uh, has it now recovered Absolutely. So it ended uh, six tenth of a percent yesterday, uh, well above the 95.5 mark, and it now trades steady near 95.60 levels in the early Asian hours. Uh, that said, if you see Indian rupee yesterday, it weakened past the 70 per dollar mark after Fed minutes continued to signal further rate hikes in the current calendar year. That apart, a spike in international crude oil prices also weighed on the trading front for rupee, and hence we have seen the Indian rupee ending four tenth of percent lower versus the dollar at 70.11 levels well speaking of the bond market sovereign bonds declined yesterday as the yield on the 10-year benchmark security uh, rose nearly five basis point to end that 7.88 percent it's most in over six weeks uh, well uh, traders do remain cautious ahead of fed chairs uh, speech which is scheduled for today evening and if you see euro and pound they both ended lower over half a percent versus the dollar yesterday and lastly if you look at uh, dollar rupee now it is trading at 70.23 levels uh, against the dollar in the non-deliverable forward markets which indicates a weak opening for Indian rupee in today's trade. Well, amongst the stocks that will be in focus today is Britannia where the board has approved splitting one share into two so watch out for that name as also Indigo which has confirmed that some Airbus A320 Neo uh, uh, you know aircraft were grounded proactively and they've cited um, a non-availability of spare engine parts as the reason so uh, the company continues to grapple with the Pratt & Whitney engine issues a uh, watcher for that name as also Ramkey Infra now a uh, ET report says that the company is in talks to sell two road assets for 3450 crores in fact um, they also said that the proceeds will be used to retire debt so uh, watch out for Ramkey Infra just recently they had concluded yet another deal and finally uh, in a bulk deal yesterday we did see the promoter offload 14% stake in Mahanagar Gas yesterday. Let's also uh, look at who the buyers were. You have BlackRock Master, which has picked up 0.66% stake, as also LNT Emerging Businesses Fund. And Schroeder International Select has bought about half a percent stake. So small stakes being picked up by some of these uh, funds. So these are the list of stocks that you need to keep an eye out for. Adani Wilmar has won the bid for uh, Ruchi Soya's businesses under the insolvency and bankruptcy process. Uh, Adani Wilmar and his bid has offered to pay about 4,300 crore uh, to the financial creditors of Ruchi Soya as well as infuse about 1,700 crore worth of equity into the company. Um, Ruchi Soya owes its financial creditors more than 9,000 crore, so this translates to about a 53% haircut for the financial creditors who are involved in this case, uh, primarily led 
uh, by the State Bank of India. Now, the second highest bidder was Patanjali in this case, uh, where Patanjali had offered about 4,000 crore uh, to the financial creditors as well as a, a 1,700 crore equity infusion. Uh, remember, this, this case has been going on uh, for a while now, uh, and finally, the uh, lenders have voted in favor of Adani Wilma's bid. Uh, now, this case will go uh, to the NCLT for a final nod, after which Adani Wilmar can take over Ruchi Soya's uh, uh, of businesses. Attractive business, it's very difficult to predict year on year uh, because uh, it depends on so many external factors like monsoon, like uh, MSP, like overall GDP, rural sentiment. And therefore, uh, sitting here today, I cannot tell you what will happen next year. But what we have noticed is that over a five, seven year period, the growth rate will average out to about 8 to 10 percent. And uh, our assumption and our calculation says that uh, for a few more years, seven years, eight years, that average eight to 10 percent should continue. Now, yes, we have been uh, pretty fortunate to get three very good years of growth. Uh, uh, and uh, logic would say that if you have had three good years of growth, uh, perhaps a uh, down cycle is around the corner. But one cannot say for sure it is FY20, maybe FY21, maybe FY22. But, but, but eight to 10 percent is what we would say over a longer period. Hmm. Would you reckon that if the if the monsoons uh, don't play spoiled sport, then irrespective of the base uh, moving up, because of the fact that tractors even now, despite being so widespread, are underpenetrated as a category, then even with a higher base, that eight to ten percent growth, maybe even higher, could be possible if monsoons stay stable, say for the next three years consecutively. I would I would think so. See, the, one of the reasons we have seen good growth for three years is hmm. not just because of monsoon. It's also because before that, for about three years, there was a negative growth. Mm. Uh, and therefore, there was a lot of pent-up demand that sort of uh, came through in these, these three years. So I would say that a natural growth that happens, if everything is absolutely normal, would be 8 to 10. And in that, about half happens with replacement demand and about half happens with new demand. Mm. Okay, uh, And that's what... India is far from saturation uh, right now, and uh, there are some concerns that get expressed once in a while that when will tractors stop growing? And, and we think that we have eight years, seven years, nine years of good growth uh, is still in a bag uh, before we start worrying about will we slow down more to the global growth pattern of 3 4% from the India growth pattern of 8 to 10%. I'm guessing from whatever you're telling me that there are no hurdles to growth unless Mother Nature plays Paul Sport. My, question would, so. my yeah. question would be then, would this growth come at better return ratios, better operational metrics over a five-year, six-year period? You have shown that already over the last three, four yeah. years. Do you f envisage that these numbers can move up even higher if the growth rates continue? See, this question I've been answering for 10 years. Yeah. Okay. What and has every, been the answer? And the answer has been that we will always try, but we can never guarantee. Okay. Okay. Uh, the kind of uh, uh, margins that we have today are pretty healthy margins, right? Yes. And amongst the best that we have had over a long period of time. Uh, can we do better than that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but but it will really depend on how the volume grows. Because if the volume grows, margins will more or less grow. Hmm. Uh, because that means your fixed costs are divided over a much larger uh, uh, much larger volume, which also means that dealer throughput is more and therefore you don't have to support the dealer too much. Uh, so everything starts working. And in this business or in UV business or in truck business or in two-wheeler business, if you sell, everything works. Well, time to look at uh, some of the top stocks to watch based on yesterday's delivery buying and selling. The first stock on the list, uh, that would be BBTC. Now, that was, of course, up about uh, nearly 17% yesterday and saw delivery buying in excess of 70 crores. The delivery volume surged about 157% as compared to its five-day average and the total volume surged uh, more than two and a half times as compared to its five-day average. Second stock to watch out for Tech Mahindra. Now, that was up about two and a half percent in trade and saw delivery buying of nearly 500 crores. The delivery volume uh, nearly doubled for itself, while the total volume also managed to nearly double for itself as compared to its five-day average. Last and final stock, uh, Bata India. Now, that was up about 4.1% uh, in trade and saw delivery buying of nearly 62 crores. The delivery volume surged about 84% as compared to its five-day average, as the total volume surged about 67% as compared to its five-day average. Toyota knows how to make cars. 
It does it so well, it became the first company to produce more than 10 million a year. Its success is rooted in a special system and began what's now known as lean manufacturing, an ethos emulated by companies around the world to make products faster, cheaper and better. Here's how Toyota changed the way we make things. Following the Second World War, Japan was left in a precarious economic position. Steel and other metals are scarce. Already disadvantaged by lacking natural resources, materials were hard to come by and companies had to be creative to compete. Toyota's founder, Sikichi Toyoda, had started a loom business, but it was his son Kichiro who founded the motor company in 1937. They were used to working within narrow margins. As the shortage of materials increased during the war, the number of headlamps on its Model K truck was reduced to one, and it only had brakes on one of the axles. The turning point for Toyota's production system would come in the early 50s, when Kichiro's cousin Eiji would travel to the US with a veteran loom machinist, Taichi Ono. They visited Ford's River Rouge plant in Michigan and were impressed by the scale of the operation, but knew that in cash-strapped Japan, companies didn't have the resources for such a system. Having months' worth of stock sitting in a warehouse would tie up precious capital they didn't have. Instead, what truly impressed Ono was a visit to a supermarket, a Piggly Wiggly, according to legend. Japan didn't really have self-service stores at this point, and he was struck by the way customers could choose exactly what they wanted, when they wanted. He decided to model his production line on a similar idea, with the supermarket formula, only enough parts were produced in the first phase to replace what was used in the second, and so on. This is where the just-in-time system really took shape. Toyota was able to eliminate much of the waste in Ford's system, making smaller numbers of parts to be used when it needed them, allowing the company to operate on a tighter budget. As part of this, Ono developed Kanban, a sign-based scheduling method which shows goods in, goods in production and goods out. It's now seen as a precursor to barcodes. Ono and Toyota also noticed that American car companies were still employing many of Henry Ford's early production techniques. They kept operations at full tilt in order to maximize efficiencies of scale, but then had to repair defective cars after they rolled off the line. Ono believed this caused more problems and didn't encourage workers or machines to stop making the mistake. So he placed a cord above every station which any worker could pull to stop the entire assembly if they spotted a problem. The whole team would work on it to prevent it from happening again. As teams identified more problems, the number of errors began to drop dramatically. Combined with a culture of continuous incremental improvement called Kaizen, the Toyota production system built a brand known for making reliable and affordable cars. But Toyota was also getting good at producing cars quickly. In 1962, the company had produced 1 million vehicles. By 1972, they'd produced 10 million. It was around that time that the efficiencies of their factories enabled Toyota to produce a car every 1.6 man-hours, much lower than their competitors in the US, Sweden and Germany. And as the oil crises of the decade sent gas prices higher, cheap-to-run Japanese cars became much more appealing to Americans, whose powerful but gas-guzzling vehicles suddenly became very expensive to run. Today, Toyota has made over 250 million vehicles. Others have looked to them to learn the lessons of lean. Combining craft with mass production, avoiding waste while striving for constant improvement. Boeing is perhaps the most famous, restructuring a plant to better suit TPS. Intel is another longtime lean ambassador and is exploring the principles in the context of AI and the Internet of Things. A Canadian hospital even used Toyota's system to decrease wait times in its ER. The Toyota production system changed not just how cars are made globally, but how we approach making things full stop. It also showed that there's always a better way to make a product. For several stories like that one, you can log on to the website BloombergQuint.com and over the course of the day, of course, you'll find all the live market action right there. Uh, Bloomberg Quint. But if you do log on at this moment, you'll find several stories that are currently available. First up, 
ICICI Bank Chairman uh, GC Chaturvedi on Thursday said that the decision on continuance of Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer Chanda Kocha would be taken after the Justice B. N. Shri Krishna panel report is finalised. The panel is probing allegations with regard to the bank's business deals. The report is likely to be out in about two and a half months. Tata Sons bought shares of Tata Motors for the third time in the last 14 months as it continues to increase promoter holding in its auto automotive arm. In all, Tata Sons bought 1.05% stake for about 670 crore rupees on the 13th and 20th of August. It has also acquired a total of 2.6% from the open market at an average cost of 255.8 per share. That's all you need to know going into trade today. Up next is Indian Open, so do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.